Well, thank you all for inviting me to come to an 8,200 foot elevation <laughs> with about five hours of sleep. But it's a pleasure to be here. And um, you know, I was telling uh, Scott and Kevin, who I just met the first time today, that you guys have an amazing company. I mean, I just really want to thank the Higher View people for inviting me. Um, it's, it's astounding to me how well positioned you are in the market. And what I'm going to do for the next 45 minutes is move you away from talent acquisition a little bit and show you a little bit about what's going on in the broader world of work and talent and business and HR and give you some data. And I think you're going to realize that a lot of the things that you're learning about the couple of days that you're here today are actually going to become more important in the next couple of years than you ever realized because of what's happening in the world of work. Um, I've been, um, you know, had the opportunity to work in this area for, well, I've been, you know, an analyst for almost 20 years now, and I've been at Deloitte five years, and one of the things that I do at Deloitte is I co-lead the Deloitte Glo Global Human Capital Trends Research, which is a, you know, massive project around the world, and so we pick up a lot of no, uh, sensing data from what's going on in big companies, and so I'm going to share a lot of that with you this afternoon and try to make sense of what it means about where the world of work is going and what that means for recruiting and HR and talent and leadership and all that. But to get started, I think the first point I want to make is this one. And just today, I don't know if you were checking your phones, but Ta Travis Kalanick was just taken out of his job today, or at least he's on, ho he's on, um, on temporary assignment or you know, sabbatical or whatever it is. But the point of this slide is, wasn't really about that point, it's that every company that I talk to, including most of yours, I'm sure, are going through a real reinvention right now of your business model. 90% of the companies we surveyed with MIT said that their, their core business model is under attack. Retailers, automobile companies, obviously, um, manufacturers, uh, healthcare providers, even oil and gas companies, energy companies. And when you ask those same CEOs, are you ready for this change, this disruption, 70% of them said, we don't have the right leadership, we don't have the right people, we don't have the right organization structure, we're not able to adapt. Now, this is the second year we've seen this, and companies are starting to adapt. And so I think um, we are in the second year of a reinvention of what companies are going to look like and what work is going to look like. And I'm going to give you a sense of what that means as I go along here. And one of the indicators that I have and maybe um, pieces of data that makes this um, real is this one. Data or it, t technology is, in, is basically increasing at a almost an exponential rate. You know, I live in California and Silicon Valley, so you know, I've been around, I've been working since 1978, and I remember the first you know, couple years I was working, there was no email, there was no voicemail, there were no, there were no copier machines, really. Um, they were literally using carbon paper to make copies of things. People would take little notes on pink pieces of paper when you, when you got a phone call. And now we have instant video, instant information on everything, um, news around the world um, happening in real time, same things happening inside of companies, way more technology than we ever dreamed of 35 years ago, yet we're working harder and we're getting less done. If you see that chart on business productivity, that's the actual data. There's an increasingly bigger gap between how much technology we have and how much work we're getting done. And if you don't believe me, here's the data. If you look at the data for the United States, you look at the data for Europe, you look at the data for Canada, and I've looked at the data, almost every country except India and Africa, the very you know, early growing economies, we are in the slowest economic or productivity growth of every, any industrial revolution we've ever had. And if you read the World Economic Forum, um, they like to say there were four industrial revolutions. There was the invention of the um, steam engine, which basically put horses out of work. Uh, the horse was the first um, job that was lost. The horse and buggy was replaced by steam, um, steam cars. Then there was the invention of electricity, where electric motors replaced steam motors. And in the early days of that, we saw massive increases in productivity. Then there was the original, which also, by the way, created the world, the internet and telecommunications, which nobody knew that was going to happen when, when electricity was discovered. 
Um, then there was the original in invention of the computer in the 1960s, originally big companies like IBM and Burroughs that were used for data processing. Again, a huge increase in productivity. And now we have this evolution, revolution, which is kind of called digital, which is a combination of mobile and always on computing and cloud computing and AI and cognitive and conversational systems. And, the, and we're seeing almost no productivity at all. And you have to ask yourself, why is that? And I think what's going on is I, I've done a lot of research on this, and I talked about this at our conference a couple weeks ago, is whenever new technology enters work or lives, we adapt quickly as individuals, but organizations adapt much, much more slowly. And it takes sometimes decades for our organizations to figure out what to do with the technology. In fact, the first electric motors that replaced steam motors in manufacturing plants, there was no productivity improvement because the managers that were running those manufacturing plants didn't know what to do with electricity. So they just swapped out the steam motors with electric motors. And then the next generation of managers came in and said, gee, we can do real-time manufacturing. We can do just-in-time manufacturing. And, and we can do micro-manufacturing. They were the ones that came up with new ideas. And sometimes it takes a generation for these new ideas to come and take advantage of the technology that we have. And that's what's been going on around the world. I know this is true for a couple of reasons. First of all, we've done research on what it's like to be an employee. And you know this, and I certainly know this, and I hear it from my kids. We are working harder, we are more distracted, and actually less productive than we maybe ever been. I, the way I like to think of it is we're basically all living in a world of never-ending FOMO at work. What is it that I missed out on today? Should I check my email? Should I go to this conference call? Should I go to this meeting? Should I get on the, in the car and go visit this client? There's too many things coming us at one time. And we, unlike computers, have to rest, and we have to think, and we have to have time with our friends and our family to actually adapt to our lives. Computers don't need that. They can run 24-7, and they don't get tired. And the sad thing about this is if you look at the data on the right, 40% of Americans have now reached the conclusion that they can't have a highly successful career and a happy family life at the same time. So this is creating a little bit of a breakage in our whole social system. We're also taking less vacation. Now this is another astounding fact that I, I identified last year when I was doing research on this. We are taking a week less vacation the last two years than we did 10 to 15 years ago. So we're spending more time at work. I mean, it's wonderful that we can work at home, and it's wonderful that we can work at Starbucks. But the problem is we don't know how to turn it off. And I don't think we've created the social norms or the tools or the systems to do this. In fact, there's a really interesting thing that happened the last couple of months. Two engineers, one from Google, one from Facebook, went rogue. And they went public, and they basically said, we have been developing addictive drugs. And here's what we've been doing. And here's the tricks that we've been putting into our systems to get you addicted to our software. Things like delays, delayed gratification. I don't know if you've read these articles about the tricks that people have used to engage us with their software. These are companies that are driven, their, their business models are driven by advertising. So they're incented to get, get us engaged in using the systems more and more and more. In fact, I was, I was sitting in the back of the room just while I was preparing and I was playing Clash Royale. Have any of you ever played that game? Completely addicted game. And I'm addicted to this game all the time. And I, I'm very aware of this. But this is what's been going on. Um, and I can't stop it either. <laughs> so. So, so these are the things we haven't adapted to yet. When you look at it from an HR perspective, it manifests itself in employee engagement. Now, employee engagement is a wonderfully hot topic. I mean, there's thousands of books and magazines and articles and blogs, and everybody's got their new tool, and all the vendors are now engagement vendors, and you know, the word happy has suddenly become the next, you know, most of the software, new software tools have the word happy in their name, if you notice that. Um, because we're going to somehow we're going to figure out how to make people more engaged. Guess what? If you really look at the data on engagement, it's actually going down. I've looked at it. I've got, I've got access to the Glassdoor data. I look at it every six months or so. It's almost exactly the same now as it was in 2008 during the global recession. Eon Hewitt just did a study um, about three months ago that shows that global engagement dropped by 4% in the last year and it actually dropped by 8% in China and India, the highest growing economies in the world. So we've got some challenges. There's some, some real issues going on. Now let me talk about what 
um, what, why I think this is and what I think we can do about it. And you guys definitely have a big role to play in this. So let me talk about some data. This is, a, this is data from the Deloitte Human Capital Trends. It's a uh, very, very large study that's been going on for about five years in Deloitte. There's 140 countries involved. Many of you may have um, taken the survey. And we ask companies a lot of questions about their work environment and what's keeping them up at night. And we let them prioritize their problems and compare their problems to what their readiness to deal with those problems. And this is the data that we found. And I'm going to walk you through it in a couple of minutes. And as I've been doing it the last couple of years, I've been able to see how things shift from year to year. And, and like one of the things that happened in 2017 from 2016 is the problem of learning and career development skyrocketed. It went up by almost 40% year over year. Another problem that went up was diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion as a challenge you know, went up much, much higher. And I'll explain why I think that is. So let me walk you through this and give you a sense of where organizations are going and what this means to recruiting and the future of work. So the first issue is the design of the organization itself. Now, I you know, got parachuted into Deloitte five years ago when they acquired our company, and I suddenly you know, became part of this global consulting firm that has basically no organization chart. Um, those of you that have worked for consulting firms probably know this, but those of you that don't, most consulting firms, um, there are, the leaders are rotating all the time. Uh, people are changing jobs all the time. You're working on different projects all the time. And that is actually the model of organizations going forward, virtually all organizations. Last year, 92% of the companies we surveyed told us that they believed their organizational structure was in the way. This year, it was 88%. You can see the data there. Of those companies, only 11% said they think they know how to reorganize their company for success. Let me tell you what I've learned. It's actually pretty simple. It's not easy to do, but the concept is very simple. Even though you have an organization chart or an HR system that looks like the picture on the left, the actual way people get work done is the picture on the right. We work, we're tribal animals. That's basically what, the way we're wired. We like to work in small groups. We build relationships with people. We spend more time with people that are physically close to our desk. There's research that shows we actually spend two orders of magnitude more time with people that are within 50 meters of our desk. That's why companies like IBM are bringing people back to the office that is so they spend more time together. That's why Apple built this giant campus. That's why Deloitte has built these big, big buildings, beautiful buildings for people to come to work in so people will spend more time together in these teams. The problem, of course, and people work on multiple teams. If you go to places like Facebook and ask the head of HR, how do you decide what people work on, she'll say, we don't decide. People decide what they're going to work on. In fact, they work on whatever they want. Now, they get feedback, and they get evaluated, and they do have a manager. And at the end of the year, we evaluate what kind of contributions they've made. But we don't tell them what to do. They decide what to do. And in fact, Lori Goler told me at Facebook, we are so into this empowerment that when we recruit people, we don't, when, we, when somebody says, we want to come to, I want to work for Facebook because I'm looking for a good opportunity, that's a red flag. We don't want that kind of person. We want somebody who says, I want to build something. I want to come to Facebook and get my hands dirty and create something. Those are the kinds of people they hired. Now, this is not just software companies doing this now. GE has gone through a reorganization that looks a lot like this. Um, IBM has gone through many, many iterations of, of its organization that looked like this. A bank in the Netherlands, ING Bank, just reorganized its entire company as a 22,000-person bank and got rid of the org chart and set up an agile model of what are called tribes and squads and shared services borrowed from Spotify to redesign the organization. So this is happening. Now, in order for this to work, different things have to take place. People have to spend more time talking to each other. Goals have to be more transparent. We have to recruit people based on their capabilities, not a job description, because the job description that, that exists today may not be there in six months. So we have to recruit people based on their agility and their learning and their culture and their ability to work with other people. And that's why things like inclusion have grown in importance around the world. 
If you want to look at all the artifacts of that, I won't take you through this. This is kind of a busy slide, and I'll work on this you know, and make this easier to read in the future. But I've gone through and looked at all of the things we do in HR, and I've had the luxury of looking at many, many things in HR you know, last, over the last 15 years. Almost everything that we have designed in HR was designed for that picture on the left. It was designed for that hierarchy where we get promoted by moving up the organization, where we evaluate ourselves with personal goals, and our career is about how fast we can move in the organization, as opposed to for, you know, focusing on teams and agile teams and people moving between teams. So this is a very, very big deal, and it's starting to take hold, and I think it's going to accelerate around the world. The second issue in the future of work is this need to continuously learn. Now, if you work in a company like I do, and you actually behave and, and work in an organization that looks like the one I showed you earlier, the only thing that allows you to prosper in that organization is a continual development of your skills. And so the organization has to give you the opportunity to learn continuously on the job. If you ask millennials what drives employment brand in their career and the selection of their companies, the number one thing they cite in most cases, every study is a little bit different, but in most cases, is their ability to learn and grow in the organization. Now that changes as you get older. And so what's been happening for the last four or five years is the L&D department in your company has been completely disrupted. And I know this because I spent a lot of time in the training industry. We did a study on L&D uh, published in May um, called the High Impact Learning Organization. We've done this study five times. And we asked companies to give us the net promoter score of their L&D organization. And guess what it was? Negative 12. So the L&D department in most companies is about as well recognized and as well liked as the IRS. And that's not because people aren't trying. And that's not because we don't have great training programs. It's because we haven't been able to keep up with all the technologies that's changed. In addition to that, if you look at some of the charts, some of the data in here, we're also growing older, we're, we're living longer, we're working longer periods of time, and so our careers are going to have to change. The analogy that I gave at our research conference a couple of months, a couple of weeks ago, was that we have to be more like chameleons. We're going to have to change colors multiple times during our career because the job we're in today may not be around three to five to 10 years from now, and we're gonna have to learn how to adapt too, and our organizations will have to adapt with us. And by the way, our businesses see this. 70% or more of S&P 500 value is now intellectual property, business process, or brand. That means people. So if we can't continuously develop people and create an organization where people continuously learn, then that part of our organization won't succeed. And one of the most disruptive parts of this relative to HR is careers. Now, those of you that have been around the business world sort of to my era, you remember that it used to be you joined a company and there was a career map and it was pretty clear and, and somebody, the manager could tell you over your 30 years working here, you're going to do this and this and you're going to go staff and line and you're going to get this kind of assignment and that kind of assignment and you could kind of gauge your success and there was a certain security in that and sort of safety with that and that's actually, you know, that model of careers is what created the middle class in the United States, by the way, in the 1960s and 1970s is people went to work for big companies and they progressed up that career over time and they made a reasonably good income and they could buy a house and put their kids to, in college. And as you know, you know, we have a lot of disruption in, the, in, in income and, and, um, and inequality in income and a lot of that is because of the way careers have changed. And HR organizations are struggling to deal with this. In fact, some of the research we got from Cedar Crestone, which is one of the largest studies of HR technology that came out um, last fall, I believe, said that of all the HR technology that companies are buying, the fastest growing segment is career management software, which isn't even a category yet. It's a feature in a lot of the current you know, technology systems that are out there. So companies are really working hard on trying to figure out how to do this. Now in the area of learning, let me just show you, just for those of you that are interested in L&D, how disruptive it's been. In the 15 years or so that I've been doing it, that's how much has changed. It has completely changed. If I look at the training programs that I developed when I was at Digital Think in the early 2000s, they are just boring. No one would touch them today. And that's because we now learn 
on real-time video, we learn on Twitter, we learn on YouTube, we learn all the time, and we have to get learning to become as agile and digital as everything else in our lives. And, and the paradigm that I like to use and give people to think about is this. When you change jobs, let's suppose somebody gives you a new job. You're the head of recruiting. In fact, I know at least one of you told me this at lunch. You're the head of recruiting and somebody gives you a new job. The first few months on that job, you have a very, very steep learning curve. And you probably need some heavy duty help. And you go up that learning curve and you reach a plateau and you're kind of, you kind of got it under control and it becomes a little boring for a while. And then you just say to yourself, you know, I'm kind of tired of this. What's next? And if you work for a great company, that blue curve, you get promoted, you get a new assignment, you get a new job, you, maybe your boss gives you some special work to do, and you move up your learning curve again. If you don't work for a great company, that happens. You realize that this job's going nowhere and you leave. In fact, one of the interviews I remember several years ago with a, with a large financial services company studied this. And this, I know some of you own retention in your company. And they studied this in their call centers. And what they found in a call center, that little apex in the middle is at about 18 months. At about 18 months, they found if they couldn't give people another job, a promotion, a new assignment, that was when they were very, very highly likely to leave. And so what these guys did, they were very shrewd. They built a career um, self-assessment tool to find the next job in that company, and they gave employees access to it after 17 months. So they knew that they would be in this job for a year, a year and a half, and then sometime around 15 to 17 months, they would give them access to this career portal so they could see what other jobs were available in the company. They had a huge improvement in engagement, a huge improvement in retention as a result of that. And, and of course, this has changed the learning and development industry and what we do with learning and how we arrange learning for all of these different you know, stages in our lives. So that's what's been going on in learning. The third issue that came up in the survey this year was recruiting, the area where you live. And this jumped up you know, quite a bit. And you, know, I, you guys know better than I do, there's dozens and dozens of issues going on in the areas of recruiting. I think one of the biggest ones is, is really the reason we're here today, is how do we use new technology, cognitive tools, AI, interviews, video, whatever we want, gaming, um, to really do a better job of assessing, sourcing, and attracting candidates to our companies. Now, the funny thing about this survey, <clears throat> a lot of these people that, that take the survey, the 10,000 or so people that respond to this, are business people, because Deloitte reaches a lot of CFOs and finance people. 61% of the people in this survey that said that they were business executives basically said, my company does a terrible job of recruiting, 61%. So what that tells me is that this is a very, very difficult problem. And those of you that are here are probably in, you know, really, uh, you're, you're in companies that are really at the very, very tip of this, you know, the head of the curve in this area. But as you can see, you know, most companies are struggling. I think the area of recruiting, if I look around what's going on, and we talked about this at lunch, is probably a couple years away from a disruption about as big as what's going on in learning. What's going on in learning right now is basically companies are saying, you know this LMS that we spent $3 million on? We don't want it anymore. We want to get rid of it. We don't know what to replace it with, but we're done with it. And I think we're going to be there with your ATS within probably 24 months. Now, unfortunately, the vendor market in that part of the market is a little bit behind, and there's a couple more years to go. But I would not be surprised to see companies like HireVue become much bigger companies, the ATS vendors that are out there grow exponentially. There will be M&A. There will be some very, very interesting things happen. We talked about this at lunch, and we basically went around this table with the folks that I was with, and everybody was describing the, ch the challenge they have finding the right ATS that works for them. There really is no next generation solution yet, and I think that's a you know, big opportunity for the technology market. The fourth area that came up in the survey is something we now call the employee experience. And let me give you some, cons some, some sort of language about this. The word employee engagement is a buzzword, and it's kind of an old one. And I'm not crazy about it, to be honest. Uh, we did research, you know, we, we started this research business, 
I mean, those of you that know what I do, I'm actually not an HR person. I'm really in, I have an engineering background. And, and so when I went into this, all this research, we decided what we were going to do is we were going to basically try to find everything going on in HR and study it and see whether it's working or not and what could we do to help companies make it better. And so four or five years ago, we decided let's go study employee engagement. So we hired an analyst who was a, an engagement expert, an IO psychologist, and she came into our company and she said, and I said, I want you to go out there and do a big study of employee engagement, go out and find what companies are doing, figure out what tools they're using, see what's working, see what's not working, and we'll give you nine months or a year to do this. And she said, I don't need to do that. I already did it. I wrote a book, here's the book. Read the book, we don't need to do this, we'll just use my book. And I said, okay, I looked at the book and I said, well, I don't really want to use your book. I want to figure out what's really going on. And I think that is the problem with the engagement industry. We're still using a lot of older ideas and concepts and books and models that were developed, great stuff, that were developed a decade or two decades ago that don't apply in the organizations that we're living in today. And the reason I know this is because we have a huge, incredibly fast-growing industry of feedback tools, enge pulse engagement surveys, and they're asking people all sorts of different questions that were, in the that were not in the Gallup Q12. And the reason that we got into that problem is that the companies that sold engagement surveys developed a business model about selling normative benchmarks to compare you against your peers. And as interesting as that sounds, that's not really what companies want. They want to know, what is it like to work in my company, and what can I do to make my employee experience better? I just had a conversation with the head of employee engagement at United Airlines, and you know what's been going on over there. And, you know, they're just starting a journey to figure out what the employee experience is at United Airlines. I mean, it's, it's really sort of interesting that they're just starting that journey, but, you know, that said, they have found two unique things in United Airlines that have been extremely poorly taken care of over the years that they're now fixing that are not necessarily problems in other companies. I don't want to say what they are, but every company has to go through its own journey, and that's what this employee experience is about. Employee experience is just like you're all interested in the candidate experience. We had this wonder, that wonderful presentation from Unilever this morning, or earlier today, it was absolutely fantastic, talking about Sandy, I think, was the name of the, the persona. We have to do that with all of our employees. We have to look at the employee journey for new employees, seasoned employees, senior people, new managers, and figure out what engages them in a unique way. I'll give you an example of this. One of the clients I talked to about this was, a, was Royal Bank of Canada. And they, you know, this is a big problem in a big company. You can't possibly know everything that's going on in every person's mind. But they said, you know, we know that we have a retention problem and a big productivity problem in the first year employees in the branch banks. The first year is extremely difficult job. There's a lot to learn. They touch customers directly. There's high turnover, high ROI of training these people. Let's do an entire study of the first year branch banking experience. And they looked at it. They looked at the first day. They looked at the first week. They looked at the first month. They looked at the first quarter. Then they looked at the entire year, and they plotted out what's called a journey map. And those of you that are doing candidate experience work, you should probably know what design thinking is. You just have to do a journey map of what it's like to be a candidate in your company. It's the same exact process. And they found that they could actually do a whole series of small things during that first year, timed at a particular time to improve that group's employee experience. And sure enough, they implemented that program, built some digital tools, and their employee experience and their employee engagement skyrocketed, their retention went up, their branch profitability went up, all sorts of wonderful things happened. So my point is not that engagement isn't the right idea, but we have to think about it as an end-to-end -end experience and study it in, in, the, in the form of personas and design thinking, not just doing a once-a-year survey and hoping that we moved up 2% over the year before. And I think most companies are getting that. We have a tool set for this, and, and I don't, I'm not here to sell a bunch of Deloitte stuff to you guys, but, but this is something for you to see later. I'm sure we'll figure out why to give you access to these slides. I've looked at this a lot over the last four or five years, and there are a lot of elements to this problem. And I, I've come up, we've come up with 20 of them. And all of them matter. Um, and, and one of them, by the way, is are you in the right job? Is this the right job for you? Which is where you guys fit. And, and is this job a good fit? 
And do I have the, you know, the tools and support to do this job? Well, I was, I was making a comment to one of you earlier today. You can't make people happy at work by giving them free food and unlimited vacation. People become happy at work when they have a great job that fulfills them, that lets them do what they want to do in their lives and has a great, and has a great environment around them. So, so there's a lot of sort of new thinking that's going on in this area. And by the way, one of the things I'll mention as we've studied the employee experience, and this is where you guys absolutely play a role, is when companies really get their heads wrapped around what this means, what it really means is creating a lot of new points of listening. Pulse surveys, uh, exit interviews, stay interviews, which we talked about a little bit earlier. I heard somebody talk about earlier up here. Um, performance check-ins. If you looked at performance management today, check-ins every quarter. Um, all sorts of new tools. One of our clients is the head of HR for a large, health, you know, 100,000 person healthcare organization in the Midwest. They now pulse survey their employees every week. They ask one question of their employees every week. They've been doing this now for almost a year, a year and a half. The data has been incredibly useful. They give the data right back to the line managers. They don't just sit on it in HR. And they are now correlating the answers to those questions with patient scores and patient satisfaction. And now they can really understand what they need to do at a very local level to improve patient outcomes and patient satisfaction in their hospitals as a result of creating this kind of an architecture. And this is really part of organizations of the future. Part of this is also changing the way we evaluate and manage performance. If you're in one of these next generation organizations where you're working on project teams, you might not even be working for your boss. Your boss might actually be a, what in Deloitte we call it your career advisor, but there might be a project manager that's working on a project, and you might have a line manager that's part of your, you know, the part of the organization that you're fitting into. So how do we decide what you get, how you get evaluated? How do we decide how, what your goals are? How do we set your goals? That is being completely reinvented in the areas of performance management. And this, this horse left the barn about four or five years ago, and companies are doing this all over the world. What we're finding in the research is that every company that I have talked to that's re-engineered their performance process told me it got better. It's funny, usually when there's re-engineering going on, there's some stuff that works and there's some stuff that's a disaster. In this particular case, performance management was so messed up that I think just making it more continuous and agile and open, open just basically created value to almost everybody we talked to. And all of these companies are doing it, and there's really dozens and dozens and hundreds of companies that are doing this. And you can see the results there. It creates better communications, it creates better um, engagement, it gives people better developmental feedback, and in many cases, the managers are happier too. I was sitting next to um, an engineer on a plane who works for a software company, and he was, you know, he's pulling up his, you know, his computer, and he opens this little portal, and I see this, you know, all this data, and it turns out it's all his employees rating him. It was his. It was his self. It was. It was his quarterly and check-in where he was evaluated by employees, and and he said, he was asking me what I do for a living, and I said, yeah, I kind of work on this HR stuff. And he said, what do you think I should do about this? And I was looking at all this data, and and that's that's new. I mean, that's great. He is now realizing that his job is to pay attention to this data on a regular basis and do what it is that he can do to make people happier, better engaged, make sure they're well aligned, they know what their goals are, their work is more simple and easier to understand. That's what's going on in performance management, and that is part of the re-engineering of work. Okay. Which leads me to the next point, this issue of health and wellness. Now, um, I don't know about where you guys work, but where I am, everybody's focused on this all of a sudden. And this is a new area of HR that I think is just coming into its own. If you really think about the wellness and the health and the safety issues in companies, and go back in time, when I was at, at Exxon years and years ago, the safety department was a department that prevented loss. And their job was to make sure you didn't blow something up because they were going to get sued or somebody was going to get killed and it would be really bad for the company and by the way, it would be bad for the employees too. Um, and then that sort of moved into the comp and benefit department and we had a lot of focus for many years on wellness programs to reduce insurance costs 
and reduced basically for financial reasons. It wasn't really just for you know, people. It was really for financial reasons. And then over the last decade or so, you know, Arianna Huffington started writing books, and we got all this interest in mindfulness, and we began to realize that we actually can't do our jobs if we don't have somebody at work helping us maintain a healthy lifestyle. And so now what's going on is I think the area of performance management is going to morph into an area of how do we build sustainable performance in the organization. I won't go into the details of this, but this is going to be part of the future of work. From your standpoint, it'll affect the way you do hiring, but it, from an even bigger standpoint, what do managers do and how do managers spend their time? Now, one of the companies that really figured this out that I think is you know, really, really ahead of the curve is GE. In GE's new performance coaching model, they don't even call it performance management anymore. They call it performance development. Managers are taught to give people less to do. They're taught to give people the advice that if you want to skip a meeting, skip it. If you want to skip a conference call, that's fine. If you want to spend more time with customers, that's OK. And that's actually a different paradigm than certainly the old days where managers just kept piling more stuff on you. At Deloitte, there's this funny thing at Deloitte. I get invited to hundreds of conference calls all week. I get emails requesting me to go on this meeting and go to this meeting, go come here, go there. But it's OK to say no constantly. People don't mind because they realize that if you have something more important to do, they trust you. They trust that you will make the right decision. Those are some of the behaviors that have to, you know, kind of fall into this world of sustainable performance in the organizations of the future. Okay. The next topic I want to talk a little bit about is leadership. So let's suppose this all happens. You have a company that's more of a network, uh, you have a wide span of ages. You have people in their 20s, people in their 70s. People are reinventing themselves. They're coming up with new careers. We've given people tools to better manage their time. We've given people tools to be healthier and, 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 and work more closely with people near them. What do managers do? What is their jobs? Well, it turns out, you know, as our research shows, leadership development and leadership is being disrupted as well. And I'll give you sort of two you know, tricks to this right now. Number one, we are not promoting people into leadership nearly fast enough or early enough. If any of you have ever read the book, The Leadership Pipeline by Ram Sharan, if any of you have been in, in the HR domain, there's a very famous book that's really the Bible of leadership written by Ram Sharan called The Leadership Pipeline. And it's a book that shows you the five steps to leadership over a 30 to 40 year career. And the message that comes across in that book is that it takes a long time to be ready for leadership. And we create hypo programs and nine box grids to determine who is ready. And then we spend years preparing people to be ready for leadership. And then when they're ready, we give them the job. But you know what? By now, these days, by the time you make them ready, they're gone. They've left. They've gone somewhere else. And so we have to put people into leadership much, much faster. The reason that I know this is a problem is Deloitte does a, an annual survey of millennials. Millennials, by the way, are up to the age of 35, so millennials are not necessarily young people anymore. Do, you know, um, Mark Zuckerberg is a millennial, and he's running you know, one of the biggest companies, most successful companies in the world. 70% of millennials this year told us, there were 70,000 people who took the survey, 70% of them told us they have had no leadership development and no leadership opportunities in their career. Those are people that are unhappy, ready for something new. So that's number one with leadership. We have to promote people earlier. Number two is we have to rethink what a leader is. In a future thinking or a future looking organization, leaders are leaders because they have followers. Leaders are inclusive. Leaders create relationships. Leaders understand the way the organization works. Leaders don't just tell people what to do. They don't sit behind a desk. And, and create plans. They're out there working in the organization. So a lot of work is going on in the leadership industry to really reinvent the leadership model. Now let me give you just a little bit of sense of this. We have a group in Deloitte that's been sp studying what we now call digital leadership. By the way, I think the dirt word digital is about to go away too. I, I'm ready to see it just disappear. Kind of heard a little bit too much of it. Um, that's my prediction. A year from now we're not going to be talking. We'll, we'll be using the word intelligent or something. Um, anyway, we did this big study, 
and we talked to a lot of companies that were, you know, ahead, digital disruptors. So companies like, like you know that um, um, Domino's Pizza. Did you know that Domino's Pizza, I think somebody said yesterday, 50% of their pizzas are now sold through digital tools, and they digitized their trucks, they digitized their delivery systems, everything. So we studied companies like that versus companies that were unable to adapt and looked at what was different about their leadership models, and we found there were 23 different characteristics of these digital companies than of the companies that were falling behind. And so the world of leadership is changing very, very rapidly, and your L&D or, or leadership development or your head of HR needs to think about this too. One of the other things that I want to come back to in leadership is this problem of inclusion, which I'm talking about next. And you guys are very much part of this too, because you're in many ways um, at the front end of this issue. We've now looked at data, and many companies have done this study, but I want to share one of them. We did a study of talent management uh, last fall. And when we do these studies, we, we ask companies to give us their levels of maturity on dozens and dozens and dozens of different talent practices. And we take all this data and we correlate it against their business outcomes and try to figure out what are the things that are creating different levels of value. And then we group them into four levels using some statistical models to see what, what do beginning companies do, sort of advanced beginners, advanced companies, and very, very world-class companies. And what we found in this study is that the companies that were outperforming their peers, they were generating almost 15% more cash flow per employee were highly inclusive companies. They had an inclusive talent system. And I think a great example of that is Unilever, which you, know, you heard you know, from Unilever a little bit earlier today. Unilever, and I know Unilever, we have lots of people there. Unilever is an incredibly inclusive company in many, many ways. And it is difficult to do that. And so this issue of DNI and inclusion and unconscious bias, which you guys probably look at as a metric in the recruiting process, is an endemic problem across organizations. And we have to deal with it. It came up, as I said, it was 50% bigger this year than the year before. And there's many reasons for this. We have global organizations. We have multi-generational organizations. We need systems that allow people to speak up We've done research on this in Deloitte. Um, people that don't feel they're included are quieter. They don't give you their best ideas. Um, they're not always supportive of their teammates. If you work in a network, feeling included and feeling being a part of an organization is actually a very, very strategic part of leadership. And one of the problems with DNI, what we found, is there's basically a lot of blinders out there. The research that I mentioned earlier. 73% of the companies we surveyed said that they believe they have a world-class DNI program, but when we actually assess them against their practices, only 11% did. So I think there's a lot of denial in companies today about whether they really do have an inclusive culture or not. And one of the things that has to happen is the DNI agenda has to be owned by the CEO, not the head of diversity, not the head of HR. A great example of that, I think, is is Mark Benioff at Salesforce. He spoke at our partner conference late last year and he, say, he gave us this story. At Salesforce, somebody from HR came to him and said, we did a study of gender pay equity and we looked at women versus men at the same job level, same tenure, same business function, and we found that women at Salesforce, on average, are making 11% less than men. And he said, are you sure of this? Check the data. And they said, yes, we've double-checked the data. We're absolutely sure. He said, okay, I want you to go back right now and give all the women in the company an 11% raise, effective immediately. That's the kind of thing that CEOs have to do if we're going to deal with this issue. They have to take accountability for it. And I think that's the reason Travis Kalanick is on a sabbatical, is probably this problem. <laughs> <laughs> and there's lots of cool tools for this. I mean, you guys have, you, you have great tools in HireVue, some of these other companies. Unitive, who's not here, is a very interesting tool that does this. This is going to get easier on the assessment side than it ever has been before. But I don't think it's as easy as it sounds. By the way, the other thing we found in the research is it's not a training problem. Unconscious bias cannot be solved by training. Training makes you more aware of it. It has to be solved by incentives, accountability, metrics, pointing out the problem so people see it you know, just like Mark Benioff did, and then they act on it. One more point on this issue of inclusion that I just want to mention in organizations of the future 
In the Deloitte Millennial study, one of the most shocking things I found, and this really surprised me, but as I went around and talked to companies about it, I'm beginning to realize it absolutely was true, is that millennials in, in, in growing in, in, a, in mature countries and mature economies basically now have come to the conclusion that life is getting worse and that they probably won't have a standard of living as good as their parents. And the world is probably going to be a little more unfair than it was in the past. Now, in the growing economies, it's a little bit different. This is really astounding data. And you know what they're doing about it? They're trying to take action. 70-some-odd percent of millennials volunteer in their community. My daughter, who works for a software company, a recruiting software company in San Francisco, took her entire company to Glide Memorial and forced them um, to go out and volunteer for a day and help people in San Francisco. That's the kind of you know, sort of mentality in organizations today. And I think this is an issue that we don't understand yet, what this means to us in HR. I think some companies are starting to get it. Unilever, by the way, is one that does. But if you don't have a program of understanding how you, what kind of a citizen your company is and what is your citizenship role in the community and the customers that you serve, your employees know that. They sense it, and it has a big impact on performance. The final thing I want to talk about for a minute is technology. HR. Now, we have spent a lot of money ripping out our old HR technology systems. We bought Workday, we bought Oracle, we bought Cornerstone, we bought SuccessFactors, we bought all this great stuff. And they basically told us, if we just rip out all that old software and put the new stuff in, everybody's going to be happy. Employees are going to be more engaged and we'll have systems of engagement and Managers will be able to see all this data about their people and they'll be able to make better decisions, right? Isn't that true? Isn't that why you guys bought all that stuff? Billions of dollars have been spent on that. The reality of it is, it's not really happened. What's happened for the last maybe five to six years is we replaced a lot of old systems with newer systems. We've shifted to the cloud, which changes the business model, but we haven't really improved the employee experience that much. The only way that's going to happen is when a new breed of applications is developed. And I think, as I'm, I'm actually going to an HR tech show tomorrow in San Francisco, and what I'm going to talk about is that the HR technology market really is starting all over. Tools like um, HireVue, tools like BetterWorks, tools like Reflective, these small innovative software companies that are building these next generation tools for recruitment, um, AI um, feedback, analytics, uh, learning, they are going to be the future of your company. They are going to eventually be stitched together in a new set of software. When Cisco decided that they were going to run their company like a network, and they looked at the organization model I showed you in the beginning, and they made a formal decision. We are going to work on fostering teams and understanding what makes teams work. They looked at their core ERP system, and they said, this system has no knowledge of any of the teams in this company. It has no knowledge of who's working on what, who's working on what projects. We don't even have any data. We need a whole new set of systems to allow us to do this. So I think there's going to be some really exciting new things happening, to say nothing of the fact that the tools we use just for general work have changed too. One of the things that I like to talk to HR departments about is this is the time when you have got to be talking to IT, because your IT counterparts are playing around with Slack or Workplace or Teams from Microsoft, and they're experimenting with this stuff. And those tools are going to change the way people work and the way they share information. And they're going to have a radical, a radical change on how um, things get done at work and where people spend their time. And I do think a lot of the HR technology that we use today is going to be embedded in these tools as well. So that's a little bit about what's going on in the area of technology. The other thing that's going on in technology is analytics. And you guys know this, because we were talking about it at lunch. Analytics has been around a long time. I've been studying people analytics since I first got into this. And it's been, and, and I've gone to lots of conferences, and there's always a bunch of geeky people in the room saying, you know, we've been doing all these analytics, and no one's paying attention to anything we're doing. I think those days are over. I think analytics has gone mainstream, and most CHROs and CEOs expect you to give them meaningful data about what you're doing. 
And I don't mean a bunch of PhDs that sit around and run a project that takes three months and comes back and says, here's a retention model that will help us figure out why we just lost a bunch of engineers. I mean embedded technology that allows people to get the data they need now. And this is the direction that's going on in analytics. It is maturing at an amazing rate. Um, it's no longer a, a nice to have, it's a must to have. And for those of you in recruiting, you know this, you really can't do your job without good data and without good tools, and the tools are getting better all the time. One of the areas of analytics that I think is really fascinating in the organizations of the future is tools to actually measure the network. There's a set of tools now available called organizational network analysis that actually can look at who's working on what project and who's communicating with who. These kinds of tools are now embedded into Outlook and they're embedded into almost all the new HR technology that you buy from small vendors. So we're going to get some really interesting data. So finally, let me wrap up with the future of work. All of these changes, organizations, learning, recruiting, um, how we look at the employee experience, what HR technology we use, what leaders do, are also wrapped up in this big concept of the future of work. So let me just spend a minute on that and I'll wrap up. Maybe two or three years ago, people started creating books and articles on the future of work. And I think that was the time that Oxford University published the study that said that 47% of jobs were going to be going away in the next 20 years. Any of you have seen that data? I think a lot of you have probably seen that. Basically what that is saying is that thanks to robotics, AI, cognitive technology, um, all these new tools we have, all the jobs we have are changing. They're not going away, they're changing. The best example I can give you of this is what happened in the banking industry. In the 1980s, when the automatic teller machine was first invented, banks were expecting to shut down their branches. And then I was you know, working for IBM at the time, I remember this. And they were going to do away with it. We were all going to do our banking online. But what happened was, as ATMs exploded with growth, the number of transactions we did went up by orders of magnitude. And all of a sudden, banks had many, many more transactions and many more business opportunities to work with us. They could sell us mortgages. They could sell us loans. They could sell us student loans. They could do all sorts of things they never were very hard to do in a branch before. And so what we did is we started using the branch for more and more of the transactional work, the, the ATM, and then we went into the branch to ask questions. So the tellers that probably made, I don't know, they probably made $5 an hour back then, are now actually salespeople. They're now service people. So those jobs didn't go away. They became more human. They became more social. They became more hybrid. And if you look at every single job that's displaced by automation, every single time that happens, what happens is the job that is created to replace the job that went away is a better job. It's a more social, human, multifaceted, hybrid job. We were talking a little bit earlier about what do you do with your recruiters when all the interviewing is done by technology. The recruiters become sourcers. The recruiters become coaches. The recruiters talk to candidates to close the candidates. You actually end up with a better job that's more human. And that's what's going on in the future of work. We looked at this data and we asked companies in this survey, what does the future of work mean to you? And basically what they said was that in most cases, we're creating better jobs. We're retraining people, we're moving people, we're reskilling people. Yeah, there's some jobs that are going away and every now and then there's a layoff, but that's not actually what's going on. We're actually going through a complete reinvention of work around us based on all the principles I mentioned earlier. Now, the only thing I would give you as a warning on this is that in this research, what we found is that the business people that are implementing all this technology to try to adapt to the future of work are not getting enough help from HR. Only one in four of those companies told us they have an HR professional helping them. So my advice to you is to, as you're out there talking to hiring managers and they ask you to fill this job and they give you a job description that's written like a little you know, task list, do this, do this, do this, do this. Your job is to go back to them and say, is that really the job? Is that really where this job's gonna be two years from now? What is the type of person you really need to hire? Because you're in the opportunity, you're better in a better position than almost anybody to coach them and help them understand what the jobs of the future and the work of the future will be. So that's a little bit of a, 
I know this is a, you know, a little bit of a different kind of a presentation for you, but there's really four things I want to leave you with. Number one, you have to think about the employee and the candidate experience to succeed, because there's no way you're ever going to do the right thing if you're not focused on that. Number two, think about the job and the organization itself. You're in a position to push back on the hiring manager and say, wait a minute, that isn't the right kind of candidate for that job. If I understand what you're talking about, that might be the wrong type of person. You can help coach them through that. Number three, don't be afraid of digital and change. We have to be the change agents. HR has to take the lead in helping organizations what it means to be digital. And number four, we have to be more integrated as one. All of these things that pull together the future of work are related. How you recruit, how we understand engagement, what the employee experience is, what the candidate experience is, how people are evaluated, how the teams work, they're all interconnected. So we can't operate in silos anymore in HR. So it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us, and I want to thank you all for inviting me to come talk to you this afternoon. Thank you.